If you would like to support the podcast and get some extra content while you're there, head on over to patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast and sign up. From the rewatch to the Q&A, we will have loads of content every week. So sign up, patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast. And now, here's the podcast. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's episode 329 of the Severe MMA podcast. My name is Sean Sheehan, a.k.a. The Pod God. Uh, joined today actually by two hosts, funnily enough, uh, to uh, to do the Severe MMA podcast. Hope you are all well. Uh, first of all, joining me today will be Spencer Kite. We had so much fun last week on the State of the UFC podcast. I decided to get Spencer back on. Everyone had, uh, had really enjoyed that podcast. If you haven't listened to it yet, it's actually kind of an evergreen podcast, so you can go and listen to it probably uh, good for the next two or three weeks anyway. Uh, so if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to it. Uh, and Spencer's going to join me to talk about the uh, the UFC card uh, headlined by uh, Anthony Smith and Ryan Spann. Uh, and then Graham is going to pop on again to look ahead to next week and also talk a little bit about uh, the Irish MMA fighters from last week who had... Had, uh, some very very good results before we do that we must tell you the autumn is in the air the pumpkins are in the patch and our friends at manscaped are here to make sure you don't carve your pants pumpkins when you're grooming I, <laughs> that's a good one uh, if you know what i'm saying uh, make sure you're keeping things fresh this fall with the leaders in male grooming and their brand new four generations performance package boys get ready for a cuffing season like no other uh, ready to take the leap into autumn with manscaped Manscaped, join the 2 million men worldwide uh, by uh, at Manscaped by using the code SEVERE MMA for 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. And I know, like, it's been a long time now. I actually had, um, I was out for dinner. Happy birthday to Patrick Sheehan uh, this, this Saturday night. And I had my, uh, it was Saturday, yes. And I had my uh, my Manscaped uh, out and, and ready to, to hit the town for that. So it's absolutely brilliant. And it's time you bundle up as well with Manscaped and the Performance Package 4.0. Inside, inside this, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, and Crop Reviver Toner, which I was using tonight. And the... Uh, uh, boxer briefs and the travel bag as well uh, first off the new brand new performance package 4.0 includes the lawnmower 4.0 if you're looking to cozy up uh, this uh, autumn uh, with, with a, a brand new trimmer the fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming incidents uh, thanks to the advanced skin safe technology 4000k led spotlight uh, it, which uh, goes on and off it's absolutely brilliant and it's waterproof too uh, also in that performance package 4.0 Weed Whacker 9000 RPM motor power 360 degree rotary blade proprietary skin safe technology I said it right which helps prevent nicks, snags, tugs and all the rest of that seal the deal with Manscaped liquids per, uh, formulations which I, which I absolutely love I need more of a Manscaped for listening to see them to me uh, crop preserver ball deodorant uh, and the crop reviver as well absolutely fantastic you need those lads I'm telling you Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to the, uh, to the performance package 4.0 the boxers and the shed travel bag so get comfy and go this season get 20% off and free shipping with the code severe mma at manscaped.com that's 20% off with free shipping with the code severe mma at manscaped.com well, actually while you're there as well through in the mints their mints are absolutely gorgeous i love them uh, make your balls a priority this autumn choose manscaped your balls will thank you Right, uh, Spencer, thank you very much for joining me here. We're literally moments out uh, from UFC Vegas 37, I believe it was, if I remember from the hashtag I was just using. Um, and look, it was one of those cards where, on paper, probably wasn't much to look forward to, um, apart from, you know, some fighters that, uh, you know, like the likes of Saryukin maybe, and uh, the main event, but in practice... A pretty good card overall. I, I, I came in for my all you can eat Chinese and uh and I sat down and I was like expected to be a little bit uh you know it to be a bit of a drag, but it wasn't. A pretty good card. Were, were you impressed with Spitzer? How are you? I hope you're well. I, I'm I'm well. I appreciate getting the invite back. I'm glad everybody enjoyed our last get together talking about the divisions. I mean, this is one of those cards that lunatics like me get excited for because I really want to see all of these newcomers and youngsters that are early in their UFC career to, to get another read of, of where they're at in their development. And so I was excited to see a bunch of these preliminary preliminary card fights. And yeah, I mean, as you said, it, it was one of those ones where you weren't expecting a ton and it turned out to be a pretty entertaining fight. I mean, we got four finishes out of six fights 
on the main card, we had some good performances on the prelims. And, and I think there's a few things that we will be talking about from this show going forward in the next couple of days as we build towards UFC 266 on, on the weekend. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I, I, one fight, I think, uh, kind of a soft spot for both of us. You seem to have a soft spot for Nate Mattis. And Tony Gravely has uh, been very kind to Severe May over the last six months or so. And Ian has interviewed him a few times. So I felt like that was kind of Severe May versus Spencer there and that one. <laughs> the tweets were kind of going back and forth on, on Twitter. But that, that to me, like we, we, we'll get to the main card and the main event in a second. But from the undercard, that was just a crazy fight. Mattis was doing very well with his jab and everything early. And if there is, you know, if you're coming in, you're listening to this in the morning, having not checked out uh, the the undercard that would definitely be one I would check out straight away gravely knocked him down towards like literally three seconds left in uh, in round one in a close round one I think they were giving Manus maybe a little bit more on the commentary than he deserved although he did very well as well I thought it was very close um and gravely came out and hit him again at the start of the second but Manus just well, he just gritted it out as you you know you tweeted it a couple of times he's a gritty fighter there's just no beating him and he came back and he ended up finishing gravely in that one that was a what a what a gym of a fight that was. From two guys, you know, man is 14 and 1, Gravely 21 and 7. Experienced guys, but, you know, both of those records very good. Obviously, one slightly better than the other in terms of, uh, you know, the ratio, but two very good fighters and, and a, a fight that did fly under the radar a little bit, didn't it? Well, and two guys to go back to what we, we spoke about last time we were on the show together um, that have a lot of experience from the regional circuit and fighting good regional competition. Nate Manis fought up here in Canada a couple of times for TKO, lost his belt to Taylor Lapilus, who was a, who was a good decorated fighter. And Tony Gravely fought on the, on the East Coast circuit in CES and CFFC. And if you look at the guys that had beaten him prior to tonight, it's all accomplished fighters. Like there's not a name in there that you don't recognize as, as someone that beat him. And so, I mean, if there's 15 seconds left in that first round, we're talking about a first round finish for yeah. Tony Gravely. And then for Nate, for Nate Manis to come out for the second straight fight, lose round one pretty handily, kind of. And, and I mean, as you said, close through till the end, but then he gets dropped and, and sat down. And as he said in his post fight interview, first time he's been knocked down. So kind of felt really weird to come out and get that finish two minutes into the second round, very similar to the way his fight with Luke Sanders went. And uh, just another example to me of, of why I continue to think the bantamweight division is the most consistently entertaining, the deepest, most competitive division in the UFC right now. Yeah. Because here's a guy that's on a four-fight winning streak now or a three-fight winning streak now in the UFC that's nowhere near the top 15, but is a handful. Like, he's a problem. I would love to see him. I mean, we don't need to get into matchmaking, but, like, I would love to see him fight Sean O'Malley. Yeah. That wouldn't be a just bad fight to, at just, all. Yeah. Just to see what O'Malley does with a tough guy like that, with a gritty guy like that, that's not going to go away. Yeah, right. Really good test. And like he, we saw a bit of that against Butinho, but obviously on short notice, and maybe not the, and I would say definitely not the class of of a of a manis. But he's one of those guys that like. Uh, if you were to look at him technique for technique almost in, in a lot of ways, I think Gravely's sl a slightly better fighter. Although Manus right. is, might be a little bit underrated too, but yeah, I, I thought it was a good fight. I, like, this is the sort of fight I wouldn't be surprised if we saw it again down the line. You know, I think uh, I think um, Gravely will bounce back and Manus will go on, but it was it was definitely a fun fight. I, I actually missed the first couple of fights of the card. What, was Radding the, the Goldie fight where she won? There was a, a draw between uh, Lopez and uh, Alething and uh, the, the Carlton Harris uh, won over Imbra Kisangana and I think that, that stood out in those I'll have to catch those in the morning the Carlson Harris knockout or, or finish was was a nice finish he I mean it was a matter of and I think I tweeted it out during the fight there's no substitute for experience right Imbra Kisangana is a hell of an athlete with a football background who's still transitioning into mixed martial arts and figuring it out while Carlson Harris is a 34 year old with 20 some odd fights to his name and just beat him to the punch a couple of times, rocked him. And, and Impa has shown in these couple of fights that he's lost that he doesn't take shots well yet. He hasn't, I mean, and, and it may be a, will never take shots well, but he doesn't wear them well. And as soon as he gets rocked, the legs go and, and Carlson Harris pounced. The Hannah Goldie fight, and I don't say this to take anything away from Hannah Goldie, but it's one of those performances where it kind of felt like Emily Whitmire lost the fight as much as Hannah Goldie won the fight. She left her arm in 
Um, there was an exchange early in the fight where, where they were grappling and she left the arm in and kind of got it out last minute before Hannah Goldie was, was able to really set up the arm bar. And then it was the exact same sequence later in the round. And you could see by her reaction, she sat down and kind of like put her head in her hands and you could just tell it was a like, yep, you screwed up and you know it, that sucks. Cause you were, she was doing well and to come back off a year layoff and just kind of have one of those mental mistakes really sucks. But I mean, it credit, like, credit to Hannah Goldie. It feels like Whitmire has done that a couple of times. Like I, she's one of those people that always sticks out to me as someone to keep an eye on, you know, that she's yeah. going to be a good fighter. And, you know, may, maybe she still will be, but she's four and five now in, in MMA right. and I, not just in the UFC. And I know, like, she's fought some very, you know, very, very good people. Amanda Hebas, Gillian Robertson being, a, you know, a couple of them. You know what, that with that sort that sort of record and being out of the cage, as you said, what is it? I'm just looking at thirteen months out of the cage and yeah. it was fourteen months before that as well. It's it's tough. It's she's it's gonna she's gonna find it tough to the to, to keep her job. I'd say I would love someone like that to go back to maybe to an Invicta, you know, win four, five, six fights like um uh, Angela Hill did. Right. And come back into the UFC. Because I, I think she definitely has potential. I think she's definitely... Go, and I didn't see the fight tonight, so I may, may be wrong. Also, I must say, arm, arm bar? Arm, and people will kill me if I don't say arm bar. So there you go. But um, <laughs> I uh, yeah, I do think she's a good fighter. And I, I, I think she has potential for the future. We've, like, we've seen that in her past fights as well. And, uh, you know, I think it'd be, you know... I, I, it'd be a shame if we lost her from the sport. I know, you know, some people get caught and uh, you know, we've seen that recently. People get caught and they just retire. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, someone like her, I think I would, I think has a big future. Not maybe not a big future, but but a future in the sport if she can get it all together. And most importantly, stay fit. And that's a big issue for her too, isn't it? Yeah, and, and that's the biggest thing. And I mean, you mentioned it. She's four and five in, in her MMA career. Like nine fights isn't a lot. And so the biggest thing for her, and, and I think the Angela Hill call, and sort of the path she took is the exact right one. There are opportunities are at Invicta or in other regional promotions. LFA runs shows all the time. There's there's different different spots you can go to get fights, especially as a former UFC fighter, if that happens yeah. to be the case. Mm -hmm. Because everybody on the regional circuit is looking for that win over a former UFC fighter to get there. But go out and just try. I mean, health is health is paramount. And so being able to stay healthy and stay active is, is crucial. And so if she can do that and go out and just get some of those reps, just get some of those rounds in and, and learn a little bit and actually have time to properly develop in the cage and in her training in between those fights, there is still potential there. But that, that really feels like kind of what we are seeing more so in the women's ranks than necessarily the men's at this point, obviously the men had a long head start, especially in the UFC, but also kind of in that lower tier of things in a lot of these divisions is that there's a lot of people that you look at and you go, man, I, I could just see, I can see those glimpses, but they're two or three fights or two or three years of experience away from figuring it all out and putting it all together to where they can be consistent. It doesn't mean they're going to win every fight. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they're going to go on to be champions, but where they're competitive and not making these same mental errors that cost them fights like this. Yeah, like I, as someone obviously who covers the, the local scene a lot here in the UK and Ireland, we see it all the time. You know, we see someone losing a fight and then coming back and, you know, bouncing back. Someone like, say, Paul Hughes, who lost the fight a couple of fights ago, and now he's fighting for the Cage Warriors title. And, you know, if he wins that against someone like Asharia, it's that next step after that kind of that 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 setback so you know that's it's big it really is a big thing in, in mixed martial arts and uh we we're talking about it on the patreon podcast as well this week funnily enough but uh yeah i suppose that's a that's a bigger discussion for another day then after <laughs> after i came in the next six fights in a row all went to the third round two of them finished it but i brought the uh i brought the decisions with me although the, the blanchfield aplar fight that was really fun i came in and there were two of these girls beating the head off each other it was, it was absolutely fantastic a great fight that was uh blanchfield came to the end of it uh, jp boys and jackson you know boys just looked like he was going to get knocked out this whole fight and i actually i'm not sure how he didn't did, did, did he get knocked out topology did, did i have the result right here did he go to unanimous decision it felt like he didn't get knocked out but um, and he got he got knocked down four or five times yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was bad um i was very impressed with Zhu wrong i think 
you know, his performance in this was very good. They kept saying, you know, he was born in the year 2000. But that, funny enough, makes him 21 years of age or 20 years of age anyway. So he's not actually that young. <laughs> it's, right. It felt like he was right. 12 the way they were talking about it. But <laughs> this guy, he he's a good prospect, isn't he? And, you know, 21 years of age. I'm looking at his record here. 18 and 4. That's a, that's a lot of fights for a young guy like that. And, you know, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing per se. But, uh, you know, and he only made he made his debut in 2016. So he's been fighting, what, for four and a half, five years uh, at this stage. Uh, and, you know, lost most of his fights early. He's only lost one fight since 2018. So, you know, he's on a, he's on a pretty good run there. But he looks he looks a good fighter doesn't he if he was like if there was someone to pick out from tonight i think he might be the one that uh, that people are talking about in the uh, the next time he, uh, around that he comes to to fight he's certainly one and I, and i got it completely wrong i mean i i watched back his fight with Kazula Vargas from his debut and thought there's just i'm just not sure 21 but yeah lots of fights over in china in a promotion where you know local guys and and kind of favored guys get good opportunities but as you said, a lot of showed showed a lot of improvements in that fight and a much better performance against Brandon Jenkins here on Saturday. Yeah. The one for me that's and I mean, look, I think Montel Jackson has a world of potential as well. Mm-hmm. Earned his contract in his first year as a professional fighter. His two losses are to Ricky Simone and Brett Johns, who are two very, very really? good fighters yeah, very good, yeah. and terrific grapplers that are able to beat him at his strong point. And I think Aaron Blanchfield is absolutely the truth and somebody that is going to be a contender in that division in the very near future. Mm -hmm. She's only 22. She's fought great competition on the way up. She's now eight and one. The loss to Tracy Cortez was a split decision that a lot of people think should have went the other way. She's a BJJ black belt. There's little technical things that she needs to continue getting better at moving her head off the center line and things like that. But that fight to me, and and I tweeted it during the fight, was a reminder that there are tiers to this. And Aaron Blanchfield is on a very different tier than Sarah Alpar. And and like I've said it a couple of times, it'll be in the piece that I'll I'll have up later tonight, recapping the fights. I never say these things trying to be a jerk and trying to disparage athletes. But I think we need to talk a little more honestly about skill levels and and where fighters fit in divisions. Like, God bless Sarah Alpar for coming out with her GoFundMe and and seeking out opportunities to train full time and things like that. And look, we don't need to get into fighter pay. I wish she had the opportunity to train full time. But to frame that as so I can chase my destiny of being UFC champion is a little bit unrealistic with yourself. And I get that you have to be completely all in. But like, Christos Yago saying before his fight that I'm going to prove that I'm top 15, bro. I love you, but you're not top 15. Like, it's okay to be like, I need to just come out here and show that I'm one of the 50 best lightweights in the world. (laughs) I just, and, and none of us seem to want to do that. We all want to be really nice and we don't want to piss anybody off and we don't want to lose any potential interviews and things like that. We all say, Oh, well showed a ton of toughness being in there. Sarah Alpar got her ass kicked. She's now got her ass kicked in consecutive UFC fights spread out an, a year apart because that's how bad Jessica Rose Clark beat her ass last time they fought. Yeah, it's funny. I was on uh, I was on the MMA fan podcast actually uh, with my good friend uh, Blake Harrison, did, and I we had the exact same discussion to be honest <laughs> about like you know if someone performs badly or is not at a level we should say it and the problem with that is right i'm sure you know you love, you you watch the nfl or you watch you know all the american viewers of the mlb or whatever it was and i watch you know man united and hurling and soccer here Jesse Lingard playing for Man United. He's not good enough to play for Man United. And I have no right. problem saying that, right? If someone is right. not good enough to play or to, right. to fight in the UFC, should we really have a problem saying that? No, it's a different because they, these people do go in there and they put their life on the line, and they, you know they put their body on the line and they don't get paid enough and all of that. A hundred percent, it's all right. part of it. But also the part <laughs> of it is the sporting part and the ability part. And these people literally <laughs> go in there and fight for their place. And we right. know exactly who's better and who's not. And sometimes, right. you know, you can see it. Also, I think a thing about it is with the amount of cards and the amount of people on cards, like you said, Christoph Jagger said, I didn't even realize he fucking fought tonight until I scrolled up. <laughs> I was like, who did he fight? He's like, oh, he fought Saryuk. Oh, right. oh, yeah. Like, I, 
we don't even there's so many fights on there's so many fighters on the card there's 15 new people signed from Dana White Contender Series who the right. fuck are these people like like we don't know what? where these people are. one of them could be and, fucking John Jones and one of them could be fucking CM Punk and we don't know the difference like it's, it's right. impossible and look we will eventually and that's that's my thing yeah. I was talking to Ian about it if I need to know these guys, eventually I will get to know them. But there's right. so many. There's 700 people in the UFC at the moment. Now, I know the ones from the UK and Ireland and some of the ones that come through Europe. And, <laughs> you know, it, and we, we take on that side of it. We, we had a huge discussion about that last week. But it's impossible to know all of these people. And uh, I think, look, I think you do a good job of doing that. But th- these people should maybe know themselves. Yeah. Maybe they prey on people not knowing them, do you think? <laughs> or, or did that, you know, did that smart I mean, the, the irony to me, right, is that we we don't want to be overly critical or mean to a Sarah Alpar, of course, yeah. or a JP Buys or Christos Yagos for saying he's going to prove that he deserves to be in the top fifteen in arguably the deepest, most competitive top fifteen there is. But then when Sam Alvey fights, every time Sam Alvey fights, the whole of MMA Twitter erupts screaming that this man has no business being in the <laughs> UFC. And so it's like just I mean, same as always. All I want is consistency. I would be happy with brutal honesty and calling it like it is for literally everyone. But, but that's just me. And I've, I've come to accept that I'm a really weird outlier in this, in this space. We we, we definitely won't be getting that anyway. But anyway, um, (laughs) I, I enjoyed the the next two. Well, Raquel Pennington and Vince Penny Kanzad. I don't think there's actually too much to say about that. Not a great fight. Lots of clinching, you know, 29, 28. Just a, just a typical Raquel Pennington fight. <laughs> yeah, I, like I, 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 Raquel Pennington kind of changed her game. Does she? Uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just having like a, 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 a good view of the past. But I, fo- I felt like she used to be a little bit more exciting. But maybe not. But I, I thought Kinzad was a little bit uh, unfortunate not to win it. Although having said that, I was only half watching to be honest. But yeah, not a great fight. Uh, Pennington came out on on the right side of that. The next two fights, though. Uh, tough on Chukwi against Mike Rodriguez. Chukwi, you know, he lands <laughs> the shots he lands are just like blistering shots. I tweeted yeah. it as like fair play to Mike Rodriguez for taking this fight. Like <laughs> if someone rang me and go, "Will you fight this guy?" I would like absolutely fucking not. Never in a million years. And, and uh, what did he get? He probably got fifteen grand for fighting him. Just uh, Jesus Christ! Uh, the 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 shots he was landing were insane, and the the Buckley versus Ohio, uh, Ohio fight as well. I thought that was a good fight to be on. I thought that was um, you know, Ohio moved to nine and five. I don't. I think he's a better quality than a nine and five fighter to be honest. I think you know some of the stuff he was doing was was pretty good, but uh, again, Buckley that power, it just you know it just took over in the end. It just won him that fight. He's one of these guys that you you just can't give the opportunity to um, hit, hit him a little bit around the back of the ear. Absolutely illegal shot, no, no doubt about that. And then he hit him with the uppercut, and uh, Ohio was gone. But um, Chukwu is one of these guys, six and one, uh, a good fighter, Buckley. Buckley's one as well that I'm not sure his his power and his his uh, knockout ability uh, will get him to a level and a pretty high level at 185 because it's not the greatest division in the world. Right. But I feel right. like he's still lacking something, isn't he? Yeah, and I mean he's another one of these guys that you know going into the week he said I'm I'm going to go out there and prove I'm I'm championship worthy. And look, there's nothing wrong with being an all action, thoroughly entertaining dude that I look forward to fight to, to seeing fight. You landed the highlight real knockout of the year last year. It's dope. It is forever going to be cut into the pay-per-view montage and shown all over the place. Every time you fight, it is one of those finishes that everyone hopes they have. That might be the best you get. You like he, he could get into that kind of lower third of the top 15 at some point, but he's a little small for the division. As you said, it's, it's sort of the, can he land that big shot? And I think against the better fighters in the division, the more well-rounded fighters in the division, he's going to struggle. We saw that against Kevin Holland and, and yes, it was short notice, but I think that fight goes the same way. If it happened again on full camps for both of them, we saw him get knocked out last time out against Alessio de Chirico, who just, had a little bit more to offer that he had to be aware of that created the opportunity for the head kick. And so exactly what you said, right? The division's a little shallow. So his upside or his, or his top end might be a little higher than some guys, but he feels kind of 
you know, 12 through 25 for the yeah, next 100%. three or four years mm-hmm. that a lot of people and a lot of people don't want to pay attention to those people don't acknowledge those people those are my people those are the people i want to see like i like those dudes do you know how hard it is to be in the ufc for like five years and and stay above water like those are the, sort of the people those are the sort of people i see fighting eight times and have never heard of them every time they fight <laughs> <laughs> those are my people. true uh, true yeah i just it can't, i can't but I, anyway we'll, we'll move on to the main um well the main card we, t- we talked about gravity versus man it's a very good fight the next three fights a- after that b- before the main event were three dominations, really. You know, our man Saruk and I always think of the, the, the game. What's it, Saruk? Every time he fights, but uh, he got a great win over the aforementioned Jagos Lipsky, dominated Mandy Bohm, who a lot of people had uh, had high expectations for her coming in here, but she did not look great at all. Now she's still only eight fights in, so we'll we'll uh, we'll part that for a second. But Kutalaba as well against Devin Carr looked as you know as well as Kutalaba has probably looked landed. His big shots, 110 in the first round, probably the same in the, in the second round, actually. I was coming out here to, to record the podcast, so I didn't hear his uh, post-fight interview or anything like that. But um, I'm sure he said something crazy, as he always did to do. But those three fights, three pretty easy fights for the winners there, weren't they? Pretty straightforward, pretty solid. I mean, you have to be impressed with Armand Saryukin. Very good. I said, it, I said it afterwards, like, the unfortunate thing is that makes it even harder for him to get a fight. Because, That's you know, if he goes... If he goes out and he struggles a little bit and it's just another decision, kind of like the Matt Favola win, then then maybe there's a little bit of like people thinking and the people ahead of him thinking maybe he's not as good as we thought. But he goes out there and blisters this dude and then is just like, look, I give me somebody. Give me Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker can't get over here. Whenever he's able to get a fight, I'll fight Dan Hooker. That was bizarre. Which that is was... one of those wild things that like <laughs> no one calls out Dan Hooker, yeah, right? Except doesn't... for yeah. except for lunatics like Islam Mahashev and Armin Suyukin. And Armin feels to me like like the replacement, the heir apparent to, to Islam Mahashev as the guy that is all risk, no reward for everyone ahead of him oh, in the rankings yeah, right now. Really is, and really. so, and I mean... His manager, shout out to Danny Room, chimed, chimed him on, on Twitter and said, like, he'd beat Islam in a, if they both had a full camp. I'd love to see it again. I think this kid is, is absolutely deserving of a top 10 opponent. I would even warrant to say just throw him in there with whoever in the top five doesn't have a fight right now. And let's just see. Because at 24 years old, he's got plenty of time to build it back up if he does lose because he looks like the real deal to me. Yeah, they're, they're probably giving to my guy Benil Dariush now, and he, he loses. Yeah. <laughs> I see he's ranked number fourteen at the moment. Has he fought Fizayev? That that'd be good. For, is Fizayev Danny Rubenstein's fighter as well, or am I mistaken? Fizayev is Danny Rubens oh, fighter God. as well. He he is booked with Brad Riddell, which will be oh, a hell of a fight. Fun, yeah. But like anybody anybody in that group, right? If, like if Diego Ferreira is ready to go, if Gregor, Gregor Gillespie, Gillespie's yeah. ready to go, like, I like that fight. I'm I'm in on any of those. I I mean, look, you don't necessarily want to fight backwards, but Tiago Moises is a good fight. But then you get into those established names, right? Rafael Dos Anjos doesn't want any part of that. Michael no. Chandler, he's got a fight book. And, and as you said, your guy, Benil Darius, is, is the odd man out right now that's that's looking for a fight. And I wonder if the UFC oh kind of Leave him alone. Push, pushes, on, <laughs> pushes on that lever a little bit just uh, to see what's up. <laughs> Tony Ferguson might fight him. Is Tony Ferguson <laughs> fighting anyone? Is he, is he a fight book? Tony anything? doesn't have a fight book yet. That, that. that might be one. He's <laughs> he's wild enough to take it. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, and Lipsky is, well, we have to mention her because she came off of two losses in a row that I was 100% sure she was going to beat Antonina Shevchenko. She lost badly in that one and then lost to Montana De La Rosa. And I was thinking like, oh, you know, because Lipsky is a very highly rated fighter in this part of the world after fighting in KSW and on. She lost, you know, a couple of fights coming into the UFC, which you, should, you could... Uh, excuse a little bit but those last two losses were very very uh maybe damaging to her uh her uh you know th- the way people thought of her um but very very good comeback fight here and she is a she's a very very good fighter but um yeah i, I like at 125 pounds it's funny because lipsky is one of those people i think that can go far in that division but like it feels like just it hasn't really clicked for her yet i, I feel right. like Kutalaba might be actually uh, you know a bad Similar, example of yeah. that as well because he is a good 
fighter, but he just he seems to lose a lot, you know. <laughs> and well, uh, it's not the best division either of them. Like so. Well, and the interesting thing with both of them for me going forward is they've both moved to bigger gyms, right? Ariane Lipsky is now training at American Top Team. I wonder what kind of impact just being around that that kind of coaching, that kind of training, that those those training partners is going to have on somebody who, as you said, had a tremendous amount of success in KSW, struggled early in the UFC. She she has lost to the best opponents she has faced thus far in the UFC. And I just kind of wonder if a fight like this for her is the one that, that gets her right, that being at ATT changes some stuff. She goes out, she shows the full complement of what she can do. And same with Kutalaba, who did this camp at, at Extreme Couture. You saw Eric Nixick in his corner, maybe working with a more experienced team and with a coach like that and with training partners that are available to him there to kind of, cause he didn't look as wild tonight. He didn't look as rambunctious as he usually does. It was a lot more measured. He does have those things like Brendan Fitzgerald and, and Michael Bisping on the call kind of marveled at his hips and at some of his takedown defense. He does have that. He does have a Very bit athletic. of a wrestling background. Yeah, Very athletic cool. dude and a ton of power. Cool. And he's still only 27. Mm. And so you figure some of this stuff out. You look at, kind of the slate he's fought. It's been a trial by fire because that's what happens in the light heavyweight division is you win a fight and then you face somebody that's way above your league. And then you lose that and fight somebody back down where you should be. And so I wonder if each of them are, are going to maybe put together a little bit of a, an improvement here, a little bit of an improved stretch and, and some better results going forward now that they're settled in and, and working with teams that can help them harness those best abilities that they have and kind of play to their strengths a little more. Yeah, 100%. I think, and like, as I said, I think Bottom could do it. I think Bottom really could. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the, the main event. First of all, actually, right, this was one of these cards that we didn't do the podcast last week because we the two of us did the podcast, you know, we did the, <laughs> so we didn't do a proper preview of this anywhere, really, because I didn't do the Q&A either. So this card was literally, I was watching it for like, oh, that fight is on, the, oh, that, you know, so I was kind of surprised watching it. Um. And Sp uh, what was the, was there beef between Span and Smith before? It seemed like afterwards. We we get to what happened afterwards, but what was the beef coming in? It seemed like there was there was something between these guys. What, was there something, or was did anyone know about it? Or what was the crack? So I mean, I think Anthony Smith is sort of in a position right now where he's tired of fighting these dudes that are on the come up and being being the veteran guy that gets put in there against the guy that maybe the UFC would really like to see win a fight over a guy like Anthony Smith. Yeah. So we had Jimmy Crute last time mm -hmm. he gets Ryan Spann this time. And there's a lot of talk about, Oh, Ryan Spann, look at, look at what he's done. And, and I mean, in the preview videos and, and preview pieces that the UFC did, there's Anthony Smith staring dead into the, into the camera saying, I've fought a lot of Ryan Spans before. <laughs> and so I think he's just kind of a little bit like, Hey, everybody like, yeah, I lost a couple of fights and yeah, I had a couple bad moments but look at who that's to stop giving me these guys because i'm going to destroy them i think there was a little little bit of being pissed off with this for him because ryan span's a good dude who's who's not going to talk a lot of trash who just wants to go out there and and handle his business but i mean you even saw the look on on anthony smith's face when ryan span carried him into his corner that was it was just the like incredible oh, oh i'm gonna make you pay for this shit. oh it was incredible like you're, you're gonna pull this <laughs> i am gonna get up and beat the brakes off of you and that's exactly what happened i i don't think i've ever seen anything like that in MMA. <laughs> it was one of the it was one of the most like cocky like yeah it was almost he got offended by him you know it was like yeah oh, are you you're not doing this to me really well, I, I, it, it, <laughs> it didn't make sense to me in the moment because no, like Ryan didn't. Spann landed a good shot I did. and you get in on his hips and you get in on his waist, use that. And I understand you want to be in your corner and have the general barking at you and telling you exactly what to do and walking you through it. But that also gave Ryan or Anthony Smith a little bit of time to recover, a little bit of opportunity to, to think through what, you know, what's coming, what's coming next, what's going to transpire here. And, and I mean, we saw how it played out, right? Like he got yeah. up to his, he got up to his feet and won just about every minute after that. It's it's funny. I was talking this week about experience on one of the podcasts yeah. and how how um, important experience is in, in mixed martial arts. And I feel like an inexperienced fighter wouldn't have done what Anthony Smith did there. And like it wasn't just the, the look on his face, which was absolutely crazy, but it was the. the 
relaxation he had in that moment where he didn't get slammed and he didn't get smashed down but he was still he kind of knew what was going to happen he was so in control of that situation even though he was totally out of control of the situation right. if that makes any sense and I feel yeah. like coming up to that before I don't know how long it was it felt like it felt like it was two or three minutes into the fight but it wasn't because the fight only went to like two two and a quarter minutes or whatever it is it felt like um Span was better than him, I thought. Like it's a Span was landing good shots. He, the way he picked him up, he looked like a better rally. He just looked stronger than him. But Smith, uh, in that moment, he was just like, "Nah, nah, hold on. Let me let me just get warmed up a little bit." And then he just started throwing shots, and he just took it away from him. Like the look on his face, and he he almost had to do what he did after that. Almost KO'd him <laughs> with a with a left hook, uh, and then hurt him again. Got the fight to the ground and got the. The rear naked choke. Like, Anthony Smith is one of these guys that I find it hard to know how how good he is. Like, because we have this level. It's funny, and we'll talk about Joseph Benavides in a while, but we have this level of fighter at the very top of the division where he had, you know, John Jones there for a good while and fought John Jones and everything like that. And it's hard to gauge... You know, say if John Jones is a hundred, are you ninety or are you fifty? Because you know, right. it's, it's it's hard to it's hard to tell. And I feel like Anthony Smith is a better fighter than I thought maybe he was, or maybe has improved. And maybe it is the you know the fifty fights odd that he's had in his career uh, have just brought him on and brought him to this next level. But like we we look at the fight title fight coming up. What it win is it in three weeks time or so? Uh, Blahovich uh, is uh, is fighting Glover Teixeira. Obviously, two kind of old gritty veterans. And you know we're talking about Kudalaba, who I think could do with a bit of the old man grit in him. Yes. You know, and maybe in five years Kudalaba will be a better fighter yes. than he is now. But it feels like Smith is coming into that part of his career now where. He is grizzled. He has taken those tough <laughs> shots. His chin is still there, you know, and everything like that. And he's just like kind of swatting these young guys aside, as you mentioned earlier on. And that with John Jones now gone from that division as well, he can show the level he's at. And like, uh, if you told me three or four years ago that Anthony Smith, I would be talking that Anthony Smith could be a UFC champion, I would have told you to go fuck yourself, basically. But now, right. Right. I, would, I wouldn't rule it out. Would, would you? No, I, I wouldn't. And I mean, he, he called out Alexander Rakic after the fight and apparently Rakic said, I'm free in December. So we're going to get that rematch, which feels hasty and unnecessary, but sure, let's do it because there's no need for Alexander Rakic to be sitting around not fighting anybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I'm a little, I'm a little worried about the way Anthony Smith takes shots right now. I think in the Devin Clark fight and this fight tonight, those those first shots he kind of turns away and i don't know if it's that they sting him or that he's just trying to avoid protracted extra exchanges like if he's just trying to kind of keep himself out of getting into those dog fights that he likes getting into but i mean you see that experience shine through right and and ryan's ryan span i think still is a guy that can put it together that has to learn some of that calm you talked about that Anthony Smith exhibited when he's getting carried across the cage and he knows he's going to get deposited on the, on the ground and have to figure out how to get back to his feet against this guy that has very good jujitsu and is a great big human being that's, that's trying to stop him. And so it's, it's such an, it's one of those things that we just can't quantify truly because for every fighter like Ryan Spann that clearly still needs some more of this top end experience or a guy like Anthony Smith, who is now showing that that wealth of experience is paying dividends. You have the odd guy like Alexander Rakic, for instance, who probably should be unbeaten in the UFC still, because I think he beat Volkan Ozdemir and you have some of these younger fight, you know, you have a Kamaru Usman who didn't need any experience. He's just really damn good. And he's just gone out and put it on people and, and won 14 straight fights in the UFC. But for the most part, it is the deciding factor. And in, in breaking down that fight and picking that fight on the newsletter this week, that was the thing I said. Like, I think Ryan Spann can get there. But right now, Anthony Smith is a guy that he's not ready to beat. And, and we saw that on Saturday. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. Like, it's just I, I funny. I made the graphic for the podcast before the fight. 
and I, I put Anthony Smith on it, you know, and I usually, <laughs> I usually put the winning fighter on it. And I was like, well, I, I was like, well, maybe I'll have to edit that out afterwards or whatever. But, you know, it was, uh, I just, it felt like a fight he was going to win without, you know, yep. looking into it that much or spending too much time on it. But um, what, did, like, after, what happened afterwards? It was, it was a classy display by Anthony Smith in the cage. And what happened directly afterwards, I thought, was... <laughs> <laughs> not that classy like Anthony Smith is this is a weird guy because I don't know him that well and have no, never spoken to Anthony Smith and I would never have known anything about Anthony Smith apart from like the last few years where he's been getting into media and stuff um, and you know he seems you know he looks like a geography teacher and he just but he did, did he's like this <laughs> this rough guy who like fucking curses at people and is always fighting and all and um, what he did afterwards I just couldn't believe it and I, maybe it's me I have a bit of a I, you know, I don't get offended by much now. Let, let's put it that way. But I, I right. hate when fights are over. And, like, I hated it with McGregor and Poirier as well. And I criticized both of them. People were giving out to me for criticizing both of them. But I don't like when anyone does it. When it's like the fight's over. You had the fight. We settled it in the cage. Unless it's some big fucking beef, you know. But this, right. there was no big beef here, but really. No, let's be honest. Th- th- this was, I, you know, you said you were going to beat me or whatever, whatever. You thought I was going to be a stepping stone and... You know, like we talked about earlier, Anthony Smith just kind of wanted, I mean, his entire post-fight interview was bleeped out for censors because, you know, after watching the grown men beat the hell out of each other, we can't hear a few curse words. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was the same thing. It was thing, like 2 a.m. Right? here, like, so I was fine. <laughs> he, he just wants, he, I understand in the moment being heated and, and feeling like you're being disrespected a little bit, whether it's by fans, media, your opponent, but like, as you said, you're in there, you settled it, you got the victory. There's no need, like, there's no need for talking now. It's, and I mean, look, not to bring this into YouTube boxing, but it's Tyron Woodley running around this week saying, just let me get this rematch so I can give this man all the smoke. You had your opportunity, dude. Yeah, absolutely. You had whatever it was, eight rounds, 10 rounds to try to put it on this dude, and you didn't. You don't get to come out here now and be like, let me one more time and you'll see no it's over just let it go (laughs) anthony smith you won you're getting your hand raised you're getting you're getting two checks yeah you're getting all the love and admiration that you rightfully deserve you've now won three straight move on with it bro like just it's okay you don't have to be so so angry about things. Yeah. Don't be hurt, bro. Don't be... Don't be yeah, yeah, meditate. Uh, it was just meditate. so weird. It was so weird. I, I was just like, ah. Uh, he kind of ruined yeah. it on himself because it was such a great right. performance. Yeah. But that, yeah. Ra- that Rakic fight, you know, thinking about it there, it's funny. Uh, I, I spent like two minutes saying that I think Anthony Smith Oof. could be a UFC ta- champion. Now I'd probably say like Rakic will probably beat him. But like, you know. I mean... Uh, he's a good I, fighter. I just, I just hope it's better than the last one. Yeah. Like Rakic, they fought last... They fought last summer, and I, I talked to Rakic beforehand. I've talked to him throughout his career. That was a big moment for him. He was really jazzed up about headlining, about fighting a guy like Anthony Smith, who had been in that contender, in that title range, and really, really wanted to go out and just get that win as a matter of having that win on his resume. And that's really what he did, right? He went out, he wrestled for, for three rounds. I think it was a short notice main event, which is why it was only a three round main event. I really, I really hope we see a more entertaining, a more sort of active fight from both men that time around. I feel like Smith will draw it out of him though. You know, I, I think it's hard to have a boring fight against Smith unless you wrestle him and pull him down for the full fight. I think so. Yeah, it should be, it should be fun anyway. Um, right, before we, uh, we, we go and before we hand it over to me and Graham, this is going to be like a two hour podcast, so fair play to everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about <laughs> Joseph Benavidez and uh, and Carlos Condit. Uh, we we talked a bit on the, on Patreon about it, for, but for those who haven't heard it, uh, or you know, to get Spencer's uh, thoughts in as well, because you've obviously you know spoken to the guys before. I've never spoken to, but my my thoughts on on Benavides, first of all, right? I think he is one of those guys where he his ability and the place he had in his division in MMA will be sorely misrepresented forever you know and it, i i tweeted out and i i don't think anyone like agreed with me baby but i would put him on the same place as a daniel cormier in the history of mma i think he was the second best fighter in one division for years and years and years to behind one of the greatest fighters of all time and then he was in another division and if things <laughs> right. had gone better for him he could have been a champion there too 
if Dimitri Shanton had gone away to uh, to tour to one championship or where's he? one championship, yeah, a little bit earlier, you know, Pinavides could have been champion, or if he'd you know crashed the car or failed the drugs test or something like that, you know, <laughs> which yeah. Dimitri Shanton, being the legend that he is, wouldn't do, but he would have been a champion, you know. And it was Daniel Cormier. A lot of people say he's unlucky in his career. He might be one of the luckiest people of all time. He won championship belts in two divisions, and he was, you know, I think most people would agree he was never the best fighter in any division he was in. But like, we'll still go down as a great fighter, an all-time great. But for me, just and this isn't to, to pull away from Daniel Cormier or anything like that. This isn't to take away from him. This is actually to lift up Joseph Benavidez. Right. I think he was at a same level, even a better level to me, because he. I, I think Demetrius Shanson was a better fighter than John Jones at a, better, a higher level. And Benavidez, you know, we talked about the 100 versus 90 versus 50. If Demetrius right. Shanson is 100, I think Joseph Benavidez is 90. And 90 to that 100 is, yeah. is a very, very different 90 to another 100 in another division. He um, might actually be 95. Yeah. Uh, he's a he was a great fighter. Now he didn't have it all, you know. His his boxing could have maybe been improved a little bit, but his jujitsu and his wrestling, and you know, even he has knockouts. He's he's a, he could hit hard as well. Um, but he was a great fighter, a really really gro- good fighter. And by the time you know his next opportunity came, he uh, he was a little bit maybe too old for the division that passed him on a little bit maybe. I also think, and I I get to throw it over to you on your thoughts after. That third fight against Demetrius Johnson should have happened, and it should have happened way earlier than he got the uh, Davidson Figueredo fight. He deserved that fight. He had won six fucking fights, seven fights in a row, whatever it was. <laughs> he absolutely deserved that fight. Should have gotten it. And maybe now we'd be talking about a former champion retiring uh, if he had. I don't think so, to be honest. I think Demetrius Johnson would have won, but he deserved it. He earned it, uh, and he was a, a very, very good fighter. What, what are your thoughts on Joseph Benavides? I'm sure at some point, Along my 12 years and counting now in this sport, I have written a best fighter to never win UFC gold list somewhere, probably a slideshow for some site when slideshows were still a thing. And now that I'm older, I absolutely hate them because I hate that designation because I think it just, as you said, takes away from and sort of diminishes the greatness that these guys had. And and Joe, to me, he's obviously someone that I know personally, I've gotten to know Um, over the years covering this sport, having started out my career working alongside his wife, Megan Olivi, um, and knowing both of them quite well. He was the second best fighter in two weight classes for about a decade. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Behind absolute legends, behind Dominic Cruz. For the longest time, his career, he was 25 and four, where his two career, where his four career losses were two to Dominic Cruz and two to Demetrius Johnson, and three of those were title fights. Like, you don't get much better than that. Like, I'm sorry, there's just like, if and if the thing you want to hold him to is, well, he never won a belt. Again, there's a lot of really goddamn good fighters that never win belts, just as there are terrific sports teams and, you know, individual players in those sports that never win titles. It can't just be rings or nothing titles or nothing because it diminishes what these men and women do. And I think Joe is a great example of that. I agree with you a hundred percent on a third fight with DJ. I think he was just a little bit, you know, he was, he was eight months out of the cage when he gets the first fight with Figueredo last year coming off a, a good performance the summer before against Juicy Formiga, who's another guy in that group that just never quite got there, but was absolutely terrific for a long, long time. And I think he's just, as you said, a, a little bit past this prime, a little bit behind the game where, where guys like Figueredo and Askar Askarov have passed him by. And, and the little, the little things that make such a big difference at that level, when we're in those eighties, nineties, hundreds levels of fighters. But I mean, to, to me, Joe is one of those guys that, I don't care what the end of the the career looks like in terms of the results. I saw his prime. I saw WEC through to UFC, saw the heartbreak. I saw the the comeback. I saw the resilience. That guy's a hall of famer and he is one of the best bantamweights and flyweights that I've seen fight in the last decade. That is, that is beautifully put. And uh, I can't put it better myself. (laughs) Carlos Condit, like, Carlos Condit was, it's funny because he got the gold, you know, he got the interim championship, but it's funny because Carlos Condit, right, 32 wins, 
28 of them inside the distance. That's what Carlos Condit <laughs> is, right? And you would yeah. think winning a championship or an interim championship would be the crowning glory, maybe, of his career. But the one fight people think of where Carlos Condit was boring is that fight against <laughs> Nick Diaz where he got that crowning glory of his career, even though he's one of the most exciting fighters in the history of the UFC. Now, I have to say that because that's incorrect, right? Carlos Condit, knockouts of Dan Hardy, unbelievable comeback against Rory McDonald, you know, beating uh, Martin Campman, beating Tiago Alves, coming off of a fucking torn right. ACL, uh, right. you know, beating John Alessio, Jake Ellenberger when he was a very, very good fighter, Dong Young Kim. This guy was legit and he even came back, you know, he lost those five fights in his career and he had two very good wins against Court McGee and Matt Brown and had a good performance against Max Griffin as well and I think it's a good time for him to return. Now, also we must say, both of these guys will probably be back in Luke Sanders as well. No one actually retires in MMA. So let's let's just put that out there. <laughs> but anyway, we leave that for a side for a second. But I, I like to pay homage to both of these guys, I think is important too. And you know, we won't go too far into the MMA retirement thing. But Carlos Condit, if you started watching MMA in 2000, geez, 2012, it's nine years ago now at this stage, but yeah. maybe you would not respect Carlos Condit as more as much as someone who maybe started watching in 2006 or 2007 or even 2009 when he won all those fights just a legend of the game really and, and an exciting fighter and one of those guys where you know I don't think he will be in a UFC Hall of Fame but I feel like a UFC Hall of Fame or an MMA Hall of Fame should have guys like Condit in it and should have yeah. guys like Diego Sanchez in it. Ex MMA is as much about entertainment and excitement as it is about winning championships. And I don't really understand Hall of Fames because I'm not American, you know. But right. <laughs> if, if I was to make one and it was an MMA one, I, I think guys like Carlos Condit should be in it. And look, he won enough fights maybe to, to, to warrant it anyway. I don't know. I'm not sure the, the, of the, uh, the stipulations. But what a fighter. What a legend Carlos Condit was. I mean, absolutely. And I agree if there was a, an impartial or a, or an actual kind of nonprofit organization hall of fame that Carlos Condit is in it. I mean, he's a guy that should have won the welterweight title. Like I still, to this day, I watched it back. I got asked to write a piece on his retirement for UFC.com this week and, and absolutely enjoyed doing it because I hate that he's a guy that's going to be remembered for, for coming up just short in that fight with Robbie Lawler. What a fight. When, or, or have to spend years, as he's already spent years, listening to Diaz loyalists say Diaz 1, 2, and 5 forever and ever and ever when Carlos Condit quite clearly won that fight. And I will take that. Or I, will make, I will have that fight till I am old and dying. Anybody that wants to argue it, get at me. My DMs are open. You can find me on Twitter. Let's argue. This might, I mean, be, he's a, he's, uh, this might be the perfect week to do the rewatch of Carlos <laughs> Condit versus Nick Diaz. Yeah, I might have yeah, to do that. Absolutely. Now. And how, I mean, I think you tweeted it out that night, right? How fitting that he retires like <laughs> eight days before Nick Diaz returns. One, one week, yes. two days, five hours, one, two, five. There. <laughs> that was exactly the, <laughs> the thing that's wild to me, and, and look, I'm not trying to start beef. I'm not trying to fight with anybody, and I'm not trying to punch up. I read Ariel's newsletter when Carlos Condit retired and he said something along the lines of who's going to remember these guys. Who's going to kind of tell the new generation, as you said, people that came in in 2012 have like, if you started watching MMA at the start outset of 2012, Carlos Condit has five wins and a truckload of losses. He's yeah. got five wins and nine losses. And you think, what are all of these old dudes mm -hmm. screaming about this guy? <laughs> super true. excited about yeah. And Ariel said, who, like, who's going to carry on their legacy? Who's going to tell people about them? Is it going to be the media? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's going to be us. That's I, our job. I, 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 replied, I replied, we will. Like, and we, the, we've been doing the reason I know about mm -hmm. baseball players from 30, 40, 50 years before I was born is because my father told me about these great baseball players of his youth. And I went back and I, and like, not everybody's going to go back and research and learn and watch old stuff. But if ever was ever, there was a time where you're able to, it's right now where we could stream literally every fight this dude has had for the last like 15 years. Cause the entire WEC catalog and the whole of the UFC catalog is there. And so, yeah, it's on us to every time somebody says, what was the big deal about Carlos Condit sit them down and say, well, let me tell you, young fella, here's the thing about Carlos Condit. He was goddamn awesome. Brilliant. Every time he fought, it was goddamn amazing. Because he, like, if ever there was somebody that embodied his nickname through and through, 
it's that dude because I was at that fight in Vancouver against Rory McDonald where he had no business coming back and beating Rory McDonald. Rory McDonald sitting there watching it, thinking this 21 year old kid is going to beat a former WEC champion at home in his second UFC fight. This is insane. And oh yeah, I write for a newspaper in town. So I get to cover this guy for the rest of my life. And it's going to be amazing. And Carlos Condit just came out and was like, nah, not today, kid. This ain't happening. I'm just going to put it on you. Like nobody has before. And that place went dead quiet when that stoppage happened. They instantly started booing because it was like seven seconds left in the fight. And they were pissed off at my friend, Kevin Dornan for stopping that fight. But like, that's the stuff that we have to, we have to, it is our obligation as media. And I don't know if other people agree with me. I don't know if anyone will agree with me, but I will try to do it as best I can for as long as I am still in this to pay respect to these people that came before that people don't know because otherwise they get lost to history. And that's not what Carlos Condit deserves. Yeah, Like Ram, Rampage Jackson being on Ariel's show and saying like, people forget about me. That's our fault, man. We need to talk. Like we all love the Rampage Arona power bomb. We need to keep talking about it. We need to reference these people. We need to start covering some of these veterans and talking about some of these things from history instead of so much of this social media bullshit that we cover every day about Conor McGregor throwing drinks and getting in fights <laughs> with pop stars that nobody gives a shit about. Yeah. I agree. But like, I could not agree know, more. Like, I, I love the way someone that, someone else is on the same page as me. Uh, or I, I think I thought it was just me. Or I, derail your, I derail your podcast. No, I love we, it. I we love might it. have to just tape one of these where you and I just go yeah, in about like we need a three-hour podcast. But come here to me. It, we, we have... Yeah. We have <laughs> on, on Patreon, we've been trying to do it, and even like so, like say I'm, someone like I'm, uh, I'm in, sign me up. Let's <laughs> let's do one this week. <laughs> I, I like it. We have been doing um, like career retrospectives, and we like we did one. Yeah. We did one kind of a Nick, Nick Diaz here recently, but like even guys like say um, uh, a Bass Rutten, who would have been before my time. You know, I would have only been yes. fucking twelve years old when Bass Rutten was kind of coming up in these prime as well. Right. But I like went back and watched six or seven or eight of Bass Rutten fights. And that's as you said fight pass is there it's open to anyone to do that but i feel like you know me and you and like ariel should do a show like that if he's like if he wants to to keep up like that and, and this is not me calling ariel out or anything i, I love no, ariel. For sure. for it. but if he wants Agreed. to do that everyone i want to do that everyone should want to do that i like when i came into mma and started watching it first rampage what like rampage was my guy i and i it hurts 100%. me to this day that he has me blocked on twitter it's the only one i actually <laughs> care about because i tweeted a joke at him once that no one watched his show or something i'm like i feel bad about it and this is back in my fandom days this is before my i feel so bad if anyone knows rampage tempt on block me but anyway i loved him like he was so funny and you know he that look in, now half the stuff he wouldn't get away with today don't get me wrong yeah it was just it's, so funny it's and just so wild to me that there's so much hand-wringing about what doesn't get done and uh and it's all the us it's all the ufc's fault yeah, it's all it. the promoter's fault like mm -hmm we're capable we're we're able to do this we know the people that deserve to be celebrated and the people that deserve to be talked about or need to be talked about never mind deserve the people that were great as you said yeah do a, do a retrospective like just randomly on the anniversary of one of these big fights or one of these big moments for one of these guys that we all say has been lost to history stand up step out and tell people their history because part of our job as people that chronicle this fight, or I think, and maybe again, I'm fairly alone in this, but I think part of our job is to tell this history. It's not just to cover the here and now and the stuff that generates traffic. And yes, that is absolutely part of the job. And I understand all of our brothers and sisters that are stuck to, to managing traffic demands that I thankfully do not have to and haven't ever had to worry about. But Jesus Christ, if I hear another person complain about how these people don't get celebrated and then nobody does it themselves, it's just, it, they're incongruous to me. God bless Pizzi. He said it's earlier this week. He said, you know, it's, it, the job is to cover everything, good or bad, when they were covering that nah. fucking Holyfield oh, fight. Shit. I disagree. Yeah. I disagree. We all get to make choices. And I understand that there are choices that have to be made. And you get told to go cover that thing. And yes, they rallied against it and they pushed back against it and said it shouldn't have been happening. But Christ almighty, we can just decide not to cover this junk and cover the stuff that we all get on Twitter every goddamn fight night talking about needing to be covered more. 
and blaming somebody else for yeah. not covering it. And, you and know saying, where's the UFC not doing this? How come they haven't said goodbye to Junior Dos Santos and yeah. Alistair Overeem and all of these other people that were released or retired or whatever? Like, we can do it. It's not just always up to somebody else. And uh, two things I will say on that. You know, <laughs> people, some people, you know, people might say, oh, well, you have to cover this job. I didn't cover it. Like, no, it's you don't. Nowhere. You just don't. It's nowhere. You just don't. The, you said more about it there in the last minute than I've said about it in the last two weeks. I don't cover. And also, I, if I, I, I'm getting it out now because I did. <laughs> I deleted two different posts this week. That's all right. If, if, you, if to, you noticed that, if you noticed the newsletter was a little light this week, folks that are subscribers, <laughs> well, that's what it was. it's because I hit delete post on two very long, angry uh, rants and instead went uh, for a sensory deprivation float on Monday <laughs> and worked out on my heavy bag on Tuesday. Uh, the rage. <laughs> the rage. But anyway, <laughs> if anyone wants to make those podcasts, I'm yes. here. I could do it yeah. some work. I'm I'm will, I will edit podcasts. I'm I, in. But I, like, if anyone wants to pay me to do, <laughs> let's be yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I could do it for you, no problem. So if, if you, if you think you can't do, it, if there's an opportunity out there, come to me. I will help. But anyway, yeah, eff it. I'll do it for free. I oh, love. Sweet. I'm, I'm maniacal about this. Beautiful. And I'm, I just, I'm, I'm. In my old age or older age, I'm getting tired of hearing a lot of people blame everybody else and, and push the responsibility to everybody else. When we all have platforms, we all have opportunities. We all have the knowledge too. And we could probably do like, look, we could probably do it better than the UFC would because we're not by whatever that relationship is. And so we're all capable of going out there and, and putting this stuff together for these men and women That's that true. deserve these moments. And so- in instead of always finding a reason to like look as i said we all have stuff that we have to cover that we maybe don't want to cover that you know bosses websites whoever it may be say yep you got to go cover that farce down in florida that everybody covered or or lots of people covered and want to talk about but if you got time for that find time for some of this stuff that you're saying doesn't get done enough because just constantly putting it off onto somebody else and here's the crazy thing. There's probably somebody else that's already done it. They just don't have a big enough platform that it's gotten out there and gotten to people. So if you, you do see it, you do find it, put it out there, get it out there in front of people so that we don't constantly just sit here and go, oh man, it really would be nice if somebody would do it. Hey, Evander Holyfield's boxing. Like, yeah, come fuck on. him, come fuck on. him, fuck come him. on! Don't mind him. Oh, wait, look, we have to end it there, Spencer. <laughs> this is the this is literally going to be the longest severe man podcast ever. Wonderful. Also, if you're listening to this, uh, anyone on YouTube, I'm going to have to put this up as two parts because it's too long. <laughs> so go <laughs> click on the other one. The UFC two six six preview uh, will be up uh, on YouTube as well, probably at around the same time. But if you're listening, continue to listen because I have now Graham with me to preview UFC. 266. Spencer, thank you very much.